We are in, starting Acts chapter 4, been working our way through the book of Acts. Uh, Acts 4 has a lot, a lot of good stuff in it. And before we actually get there, I kind of want to explain some terms and also give a little background uh, before we actually start in that, because we're going to start meeting uh, the two different groups the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and so I want to kind of give you a brief description of the difference. And the Sadducees, uh, in the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin is made up of of 70 plus uh, the one high priest, so 71 total. The Sanhedrin actually had most of the power, and they had the most numerous members in the Sanhedrin compared to the Pharisees. The Pharisees had more... uh, more people were Pharisees than Sadducees, but not in the Sanhedrin where they had the power. And it was through the Sanhedrin where the high priest came from. So they had more power uh, than the Pharisees did. Now, the biggest difference between the two is the Sadducees didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, while the Pharisees did believe in angels, and they also believed in the resurrection of the dead. So there are two competing groups, political groups, you might say, with different beliefs and different doctrines. There was also a third group, which was called the Essenes, and the Essenes uh, weren't in the Sanhedrin, uh, but they were the ones who wrote uh, or copied the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and actually they were a lot closer to the truth than either the Pharisees or the Sadducees. And they were down, uh, well, actually, they were all throughout Israel. In fact, many scholars think that John the Baptist was in his scene. But anyway, uh, so there's the difference. And an easy way to remember that, if you've probably maybe heard this before, about the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, who don't believe in angels, that is why they are sad, you see. Okay, so just an easy way to kind of remember the difference between the two, okay? And so I want to look at a, uh, a couple of verses before we get to Acts 4, uh, at, you know, as examples of this. So Luke 20, we're going to see where uh, Jesus comes up against the Pharisees. And uh, we're going to look at verses 27 through 39. And this is where the, the, or the uh, Sadducees are, are, are coming up to test Jesus, okay? Try to catch him. And it says in verse 27, it says, Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and he leaves a wife but no children... The man must marry the widow and have children for his brothers. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? And Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in this age and in the resurrection of the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for in him all are alive. So some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared to ask him any more. So the Sadducees were trying to catch him in this because they don't believe in the resurrection, and so they gave him this this, uh, example, extreme example of what could happen, and and he answers it. And 
corrects their, um, you know, their belief that, yes, there is a resurrection of the dead. Now, another example of this is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll turn it over real quick because I'm going to be going to a lot of different verses today. And I'm going to read verses 12 through 19. And this is Paul as he's, he's writing to the uh, Corinthian church. And it says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raises Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For the dead are not raised, and Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep, meaning have fallen dead in Christ, are lost. If it's only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. So again, in this case, it, it's uh, Paul addressing this same situation. And he says, hey, if there's no resurrection, your faith is futile. Why, why even bother? And it kind of, I remember yesterday when I, during a celebration of life service, I was making a point about those who are outside of Christ who do not believe in Christ, that they ought to self-medicate. Do some drugs, do some alcohol, do something, because you have no future. And I saw several... And they were turning, what did he just say? You know. <clears throat> but again, I was making a point, just that Jesus did many times, you know, he, he used hyperbole to make a point. Like he said, you know, if your right eye causes you to sin... Pluck it out, if your arm costs you, you know, cut it off. Obviously, just making a point in the person's fight against sin. But anyway, I, it was quite a reaction. I saw people's faces out there. But <clears throat> All right. The other thing I want to look at before we actually get to chapter 4, I want us to look at Peter. And I want us to look at how different Peter was before he was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then after he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the boldness and the courage that he had. Okay, so if we go back to John, Gospel of John, chapter 18, this is the famous time where Peter denied the Lord. You all know the story three times, but I just want to look at it briefly through that. Uh, in John 18, verse 17... He said, this a servant girl said, you are not one of the disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. So he denies the Lord there. You come down to verse 25, and Simon Peter stood warming himself. He was asked, you are not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. And then one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? And Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. And if you get some other uh, of the gospel, it says that Jesus looked at him at that moment and he caught his eye contact. And so Peter denied the Lord three times, okay? And he's right in front of the, you know, it's the same people, uh, the Sanhedrin, it's the high priest, it's Ananias and, and Caiaphas that he's doing this before. So, as we go, we'll go to chapter, uh, actually we'll make it to Acts chapter 4 now, finally. Now, in Acts chapter 3, you know the story of what had happened, there's a 
a, a, a crippled man who's been crippled from birth. He's over 40 years old. And, you know, as Peter and John walk in, they see him. And he's thinking, you know, they're going to get a gift from him. He's asking for alms because that's the way people survived who were crippled and didn't have a way of, you know, we didn't have Social Security or, or any other thing like that. So they would place them in front of the temple so they could receive alms from people going in. So this guy thinks he's going <clears> to <throat> receive alms from John and Peter. And Peter and John say, you know, or Peter says, you know, Silver and gold have I not, but what I give you, in the name of Jesus, arise and walk. And so the guy's miraculously healed. I want you to think something. He's he'd been placed there every day from the temple. So Jesus walked by him. Peter and John and all the disciples walked past him different times, right? They didn't heal him then. So there's a right time. When God does things, he has a plan, he has a purpose. And we might be asking, well, why? Why, you know, just like the pool of Bethesda, when all these people are around, you know, there are a lot of people who, are, who need healing, but he went to the, the one in this case. So, as we start chapter 4, we're going to look at the first three verses. And it says, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Now, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized Peter and John. And because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. So the, the Sanhedrin arrests them. They bring them in, and, and the Sanhedrin would, would normally meet in the morning. So they arrest them, hold them for the next day. But the important thing to say is that they were preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Well, obviously, that's a problem for the uh, Sa uh, Sadducees because they don't believe in resurrection. But the other big part of it is, is in the name of Jesus. That's going to be a problem here in a minute. Verse 4, But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. So that probably means there's at least 10,000 when you figure the women and, and children would be even more than that. So... And over in uh, chapter 5, verse 17, it says, And the high priests and all the associates who were members of the party of the Sanhedrin were filled with jealousy because they're having this impact, this sudden growth of this sect, what they would consider a cult that's growing, okay? So verse 5 through 7 now, the next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And as the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. Now, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do that? Okay, that, that's a big deal, okay, because they're asking, in the Old Testament, you know, they have names of Yahweh, Elohim, which means God, Adonai, which means Lord. Uh, many, even many Jews today will use the name Hashem, which means the name. In other words, they think it's so holy, they would not even say the name, Okay. So the name was a big thing. And if they're doing these miracles, and in the Old Testament, if someone prophesied in another name of another God, they would be stoned. Or if you, in this case, healed somebody in another name, you could be stoned. 
And there's a prayer that religious Jews uh, pray twice a day. It's called the Shema. And I'll read it to you. It says, Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God. Adonai is one. Blessed is God's name. His glorious kingdom is, is forever and ever. And you shall love Adonai, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now, I want to make emphasis that Adonai is one. Okay, that creates a problem. Because as Christians, we say there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. Well, that's blasphemy to a Jew. There is one. Adonai is one. But at the same time, it created a problem for the rabbis because we keep having in the Old Testament, which we know is Jesus, but the Lord showing up in the Old Testament in the physical form. Okay? So many rabbis came up with a theory, okay, of, of the two Yahwehs, one visible, one invisible. And uh, because, you know, it says in Scripture that no one has seen God, and, and if anyone ever seen him, you would die. And yet we have this happening in the Old Testament. To give you a quick example, I'll go to Genesis Let's see, Genesis, what do I want? 18. Story of Abraham. And as he's sitting in his tent, and it says, Three, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent. In the heat of the day, Abraham looked and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of the tent to meet them and to bow low into the ground. And as you go on through that passage, it says, Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So two angels showed up along with the Lord. Plus you have, um, you have Samson's parents, remember, As Samson, uh, as the Lord appeared to Samson, and they they made an altar and told him about what Samson was going to do and be, and and, uh, they make a a sacrifice, and then the Lord goes up in the sacrifice, and they go, oh, no, we have seen the Lord. We're going to die. So we have that. We have Jacob wrestling with the Lord. We have many instances in the Old Testament of the Lord showing up in a physical physical form. So that is a, a, a bit of a problem for them. But you can see why, from the Jewish point of view, from an Israelite, it was so strongly put in then that the Lord God is one because it was a polytheistic, you know, all the nations around them would have many gods. Sun God, moon God, uh, Moloch, you know, Baal, all the different gods, you know. And all those different gods, by the way, just continue to transfer whether it's going to the Greeks and their pantheons and the Romans. The only thing that changed was the names. Same gods, different names. So the name is a big big thing. Okay, verses 8 through 11. So then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, Now this man stands before you healed. 
He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. So the Lord used this situation to have the leaders, religious leaders of Israel, all in one place. They all hear the gospel. They all rejected it, but they all heard it. And I want to read a couple, and this is taken, by the way, when he, he says, the stone the builders rejected, which has become the capstone, was from Isaiah 28, verse 16. So he quotes that. But I, I want to go back to 1 Peter, because he also later, like I told you, we'll be moving around a lot here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10. So Peter's writing, and he says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So Peter uses that again, that, that Jesus, taking from the Old Testament, hey, this is the stone that's going to cause people to stumble, or it's going to cause salvation to rise, one or the other. And it also, in Luke chapter 20, Jesus uses that same phrase, that same Talk about the stone in Luke chapter 20. In verse 17 through 19. And this is after during chapter 20, Sadducees, the Pharisees are asking about what you know, what authority he's doing, what he's doing. Uh, and they give him, they, Jesus gives a parable, and he gives a parable which is very explicit that tells them that they're going to end up rejecting and what's going to happen to the nation that they were going to be basically destroyed. So when he comes to verse 17, he says, Jesus looked directly at them, and he asked, then what is the meaning that is that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests look for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. So again, we have all this talk about the stone, that he is the living stone, that he's the one, he's the capstone, and he's the one that's going to cause either many people to fall or to come to salvation and the life. All right, back to Acts. Or, okay, yeah, verse 12. Okay. Salvation is found in no one else, 
For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That verse is probably one of the bedrocks of Christianity. There's no other name. No Buddha, no Muhammad, no one else. There's only one name. And that causes a lot of friction. That causes a lot of animosity against Christians because they, they say, so you say you're the only way. Yes, there is only one way. It's only through Jesus. And so that causes friction. It causes anger. But it's the truth, and it's a bedrock of Christianity. There is only one way. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, again, remember the comparison between Peter before, filled with the Spirit, and later, and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So, in other words, these men, Peter and John, had not been to the cemetery. Oh, I'm at semin- seminary. I'm sorry. Sorry. Just a slip. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but people will know that you've been with Jesus. And by the way, as far as that, you know, the cemetery or a seminary, there is so much information, so many courses you can get online, so much study you can get, so many helps that if you really want to do it, you can do it. You can do it on your own self-study and get more than you would out of some many seminaries, okay? We'll do 14 through 17. But they could see that the man who had been healed, standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Again, in this name, the name of Jesus. Now, many times we think, you know, if, if people would just see a miracle, they would believe. It's not true. You can see a miracle just like these. They knew the miracle happened. They knew the guy had been crippled from birth, been miraculously healed didn't make them believe. So sometimes we think that, think, well, if, if my cousin, if he would just see a, a real miracle, he would believe. Not necessarily. Okay? All right, verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So there is no way they could keep silent. And again, see that boldness that was in them now. That wasn't in them before. And there is no way they could keep silent, no matter what threat was coming after them. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So they couldn't justify it, and they had the fear of man because in this case, if they could have, they would have. But they feared the people because all the people knew this miracle had happened. So the fear of man was in them. Verse 23 through 
30. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. And they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Now when they heard this, they raised their voice together in prayer. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David. Why do the nations rage? And the people plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city and conspired against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed. They did what was in their power and what had been decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your servants, Jesus. What a prayer. So they go back, they're gathered together, we've been threatened, how do we respond? We go to the Lord asking, Lord, give us that boldness, stretch forth your hand to heal the sick, to do miracles. And in the name, you don't back down from the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So they were filled again with the Holy Spirit. Many times we think, well, we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but the problem is we leak, you know? And so we need to be continually refilled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-and-done thing, because life, trials, tribulations of this life, which Jesus said, take heart, and, you know, you're going to have trials in this life. We get beat down sometimes. We get discouraged. Just relationships, facts of life, just living in a fallen world, and so we need to be refilled. And so sometimes we just need to come for the Lord and say, Lord, I, I need to be refilled. You know, I've lost something. I've lost that fire. I've lost that edge that I've gotten dull. I need to be sharpened again. So Lord, help me. Fill me once again, Lord. You know I'm but flesh. And the Lord will do it. He will refresh it. He will re-energize and strengthen you in your inner man. All right, and then we'll take the last passage. And it says, All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possession was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a piece of field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So there was complete unity, oneness of spirit, oneness of... of uh, it wasn't communism, because sometimes people think, oh, well, that sounds almost like communism. No, it was people... No one was taking it. People were giving, because their hearts had been changed. 
And they were willingly doing this so that no one among the people was poor. And there was great unity among the people. And so what we see really from Acts chapter 4 throughout the rest of the, the book of, of Acts, you're going to see you're going to see the gospel go forth, and then there's a counterattack. You take ground, and the enemy comes back. And that goes all the way through, uh, through the book of Acts. And you even see, going to such trouble, some of these people who persecuted, some of the Jews who were persecuting the church in one town, they would go to the next town the apostles escaped to, to follow them there. And so it was like, Constant warfare, constant being attacked, constantly gaining ground, gaining converts, churches growing, but also attacks. And that continues to our day. We're going to see that where, yes, we gain ground, good things happen, and then there's a counterattack from the enemy. So we shouldn't be surprised by that, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, just know that that the Lord will lift up a standard. And so we see this pattern go throughout the book of Acts and again into the new, throughout the New Testament. And the enemy will use whatever he can to bring discouragement, to stop the word of God from proceeding. And the, and the Lord allows a certain, that amount of, of warfare. So we have to equip ourselves, put on the full armor, Realize that the enemy's tactics stand against it. And so Acts has so much for us to see of, of, of example of what the New Testament church should look like, how it functions. As we go through Acts, you, you begin to see more and more as it begins to develop and as it goes out from Jerusalem and Samaria to the uttermost ends of the earth and how it is set up, how there's elders put in, um, how the apostles travel from here to there, spreading the word. And it's a, it's a great template, blueprint, for what the church, the New Testament church, is supposed to be like. And that's where everyone has a place, everyone has a part, everyone has a gift, and we all need everyone functioning together in their gifts and being that part. All right, so that's Acts chapter 4. Let's pray. I want to let anybody needs prayer for, for anything, whether it's healing or uh, just whatever is on your heart, feel free to come up. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Your word is so rich. Lord, we thank you for the template, for the blueprint that you've given us, Lord. Lord, give us wisdom how to walk that out how to become more and more like a New Testament church. Lord, how some of our plans and, and the way churches are set up today, and, and, and Lord, with a, a one person, one pastor uh, leadership, Lord, that was really not your pattern, Lord, but the fivefold ministry, Lord. The part about each one being involved each one taking a part, each one using their unique gift to build up the body. So, Lord, we ask for your help. We ask for your wisdom. You ask, we ask that you'd give us revelation, discernment. Lord, how the New Testament church is to go forth now, Lord. You're, you're wanting to change churches. You're wanting to change what they look like, how they function, how we go forward. So, Lord, we ask for that wisdom and direction, Lord, that you would show us the way, that we'd break off old patterns of how we think things should work, and we begin to line ourselves up with your pattern. And, Lord, we thank you for those who've gone before us preparing the way. And, Lord, as we enter this time of the truly end times of the end times, prepare us, Lord, for everything that's going to be taking place, for the shakings that are coming, the increased shakings, 
where everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Lord, that we're living in a time of a unique time. And Lord, even though the darkness is encroaching and increasing, Lord, as you said in Isaiah 60, rise and shine. Take your place. Let your light shine in the midst of deep darkness. So Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing in us and through us. We continue to pray for that increase of your presence. Lord, we covet your presence. Lord, when you walk in the room, everything changes. And Lord, we long for an increase of your presence that changes hearts, that changes minds, that realigns, refocuses. And Lord, we just say we want more, Lord. More love, more power, more of you in our lives. Asking for the increase of the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, an increase of your authority. Lord, that we might be that church, pure, spotless bride of Christ. Lord, give us clean hands and pure hearts. Lord, that we would be able to receive the fullness of the Spirit, Lord. Those without mixture can contain the Spirit without measure. So, Lord, continue to purify us, renew our minds by the washing of your word. Lord, change us from the inside out, Lord. Let revival start in each one of us. Stir us up, O Lord. Stir us up for a hunger for you and for more of you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we had our prayer meetings on Wednesday night for a while and thought it was excellent. Very good. I would like to see us do that again, but I, I, don't want, I want it to come from the congregation. I know Michael had said something about, and I had said that, that same verse, can't you tarry with me one hour? And I know um, Steve Osborne had had that on his heart earlier when we did those, those dates. But I want it to come from you all, to have that desire to do it, and we'll set a time. You want to do it once, you know, once a week? But again, just to have that heart, and, and I want, again, just for you, it's not going to be top down, it's going to be from the, from the congregation up. And we'll see how it goes. So be talking among yourselves. If you have that heart, ask others, and we can set it up. We'll be glad to announce it, get times to do that. Again, if anyone needs prayer, feel free to come up, and we'll be glad to pray for you. And otherwise, have a great evening and afternoon, and go Chiefs, right? So, all right.